No, that's a good idea indeed. Anytime uh, you can ask questions, and I'll just wave this stick. Yeah, yeah. Um, <coughs> but really, it's better if it's a bit. Uh, yeah, just interrupt me, uh, and I'll just get started on uh, this nice topic of the logic of knowledge. Um, good. Well, you see a whole list of topics I didn't want to deal with today. Um, well, not today, today and tomorrow. Um, so first, I'm going to say a bit about, uh, well, how knowledge and belief is modeled in this, you might say, uh, in this is in the formal setting where we want to model uh, systems and structures and do things with arrows. Um, then I'll spend mainly a lot of time on what is known as public announcement logic. Um, this is one of these things. Um, so, so um, well, things are being called in a certain way, and this logic is called public announcement logic because uh, there is things like, uh, well, that are indeed public announcements, uh, <coughs> um, but there are many other things that are also public announcements, and we will see other examples of that. And I just realized that a great example of a public announcement is the starting up of the IMSC car. Because then you have to rush to the bus and get in, and if you miss it, then it's your fault. <laughs> so th there are lots of things that, but nothing is announced, right? The exhaust of a car doesn't make, a, uh, well, it makes noise, but it doesn't speak. Anyway, public announcement logic. Um, there are a number of, well, you might say funny phenomena, re well, that are related to this logic and that also a bit explain its existence, uh, which go back to certain philosophical questions uh, posed by a guy called Moore, G.E. Moore. So I'll spend some time on Moore sentences. And then actually all the rest will be for tomorrow. So then there will be a transition to, um, well, events that are not public, so that doesn't do not have this uh, word public uh, in it. And <coughs> And then we will see how far we get uh, with that. Um, for all these, um, well, systems I present, I do this in the, you might say, traditional uh, logic style, where I um, try to talk my way through some kind of motivating examples. Well, not traditional logic style, but traditional logic style in this branch of modeling systems. I, I present motivating examples that I want to model. I come up with some structures that, that well, are supposed to model these correctly. Actually, I have no reason whatsoever to, to have firm belief in that, but then I just stipulate this as the right way to model it. And then I propose a formal language in which I can say things about these structures. And then I start to uh, do things about how this language relates to these structures and uh, well, uh, talking about axiomatizations, uh, things like decidability, succinctness, well, lot, lots of things that have to do with uh, those matters. And then, well, and then I go to a next motivating example and I do the same trick all over again. So that will be more or less the, the pattern of uh, what I will do. Okay, um, so let's start with the logic of knowledge and belief. Um, very simple, I like uh, things uh, that have to do with uh, cards. So here we have uh, a number of cards, three cards, actually a stack of cards. Um, part of this business goes back to um, the bidding and bridge. So there's some, some motivating example further in the background, but well, uh, a full stack of cards is 52 cards, right? So you want to have three, that might be enough, and then you can maybe already say a lot about uh, logic and uh, knowledge. So we have um, uh, three cards, uh, zero, one, and two, and um, the idea is that, um, well, as useful in uh, card deals, that players only know their own card. <clears throat> so we have uh, that each player draws this uh, card, and um, it so happens that N draws zero, and Bill one, and Kath two, and um, well, and we present this by a triple like this. Okay. Well, suppose we are N. What does N know about this card deal? Well, she knows that she has card zero, but she, um, and she knows that both other players have a single card, but she doesn't know <laughs> which player has which card, right? So there's some kind of uncertainty for her between two card deals, zero, one, two, and zero, two, one. Yeah, we can represent this uncertainty well, by drawing a, a, a link with a label, but you can see this in any way. You can see this as an equivalence class of indistinguishable card deals. So there are a number of ways in which you can represent this, but you need 
to refer to other states of affairs than the actual state of affairs, which is represented here by the 0 to 1, 2. Um, then the thing is that for a player, Bill, um, he has a different view, uh, you might say, of this actual state of affairs because he has card 1, so he's uncertain between card 0 and 2 uh, in possession of N and Kath, or Kath and N. So this is Bill's uncertainty. Um, same for Kath, she would be uncertain between the two card deals that contain card 2. Um, now the question is where, well, whether we have now done the job or whether there is more to do. Um, consider this, so what, what is written here and, and below, so N holds card 0, right? But she knows that Bill can imagine Kath to hold 0. Well, that's reasonable, right? Because Bill has card 1. So Bill considers it possible that Kath has card 0. In that case, Kath would know that she holds card 0. And when would Kath know that she holds card 0? Well, in the card deals 1, 2, 0 and 2, 1, 0. Um, 1, 2, 0 is not in the picture. So this picture is incomplete. And the reason it's incomplete is that um, N can reason about well, not only about what she knows herself, but also what she knows about what Bill knows, or what she knows about what Bill knows about what Kath knows. Yeah, so we have a, what, what is called a higher order aspect of knowledge that is not yet represented in this restricted, you might say, structural representation of the system. Yeah, for that reason, um, well, you might say that justifies a, a, a more uh, complete representation where for this toy example all six card deals yeah, are actually being uh, represented and um, well and now we have indeed that um, now I can nicely use this stick or the pointer too but I like sticks um, yeah, that um, what I just said that uh, and knows that Bill can consider uh, uh, Kath to uh, hold this card zero. So what N knows is what is true in the point here and the point there. And um, as N is uncertain about what card Bill has, okay, N might consider Bill to have one and might have consider Bill to have two. But in both cases, Bill considers it possible that Kath holds zero and that is going from here to here or when he holds two, it's going from here to here. So now we have a way to relate this, this, this statement with all these four cardinals. Okay, let's do this a bit more systematically. Um, for example, we have that N knows that Bill knows that Kath knows her own cards. Um, well, I'm going to introduce a, a formal language too, a logical language. Um, <coughs> I've understood that uh, most of you will know um, propositional logic, but not necessarily modal logic, so uh, operators like this I call modal operators, and um, for those who have seen a bit of modal logic, those are modal operators of the necessity kind. Um, and uh, this, well, uh, relating to this structure, you know something if it's true in all states that you consider possible, so um, an, an expression like this uh, would be true if it's not only true here, but also true here. We will see more examples of how this works. Um, the example, well, just now, where although n has zero, she, well, by some line of argumentation, she considers it possible that, that Bill actually thinks that Kath has zero, but if that is so, then Bill must consider it possible that n doesn't have zero, right? Okay, this is written in the last line. So here we see that, um, well, zero subscript a stands for n holds card zero, and uh, the funny hat means consider possible, so N considers it possible that Bill considers it possible actually that Kath knows that uh, N doesn't have zero. Yeah, so in this case this is not a contradiction, N holds zero and N doesn't hold zero, no. It's, it's quite consistent for N to hold zero, but by some line of argument for other uh, players, agents here, yeah, to, to reason about uh, the possibility that she doesn't have uh, a card zero. Um, okay. There are a number of other things that you can do um, with uh, knowledge. <laughs> the, 
that do not refer to uh, what a single agent knows, but to what uh, agents in a group know. Um, and uh, before saying that, let me uh, once more refer to what we by now know about uh, individual knowledge. So, uh, N knows uh, what is true in, well, in an equivalence class, so what is true in two states linked by an A uh, labeled link. Uh, so, N knows in this underlined state what is true here and here. So given that she holds zero here and zero here, it's true that she knows that she holds card zero. Yeah, you could compare this with um, having drawn the card out of the stack but not having yet looked at it, then she already holds zero, but she doesn't know it. Eh? So you have to see your card before you know it. Um, but there are other things that relate not to the knowledge of individual agents, but to the knowledge of, um, well, uh, agents in a group. And one of the best known examples of that is called uh, common knowledge. Yeah. So common knowledge is what I know about what you know, what I know is things that iterate and then still are the case. Well, in, in terms of this structure, <laughs> common knowledge is what is known if you follow a couple of these links, yeah, if you have a path labeled by the, the agents in the group that commonly know something. Um, well, now I'm giving you this story, I realize I'm going to introduce common knowledge without giving uh, killing motivating examples. That is partly because I'm going to focus on the dynamics and not on the, on the um, group aspects. Um, but one, maybe I should give uh, at least one example. So one of these typical things that is often uh, given to introduce common knowledge is, uh, is driving on a particular side of the road. Yeah. And 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 it and, and well and, and you can you motivate this say by uh, considering how safely you feel depending on whether you know <laughs> that other cars coming towards you uh, at high speeds also are aware of what side of the road one is supposed to drive. Yeah. So the setting is say of two um, well Martians say landing on a particular spot in Earth, um, which could be either in India or say in France. And, um, and, and, and this is supposed to land on a, it, it's a bit hypothetical, and it also has to do with me currently being reading this Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, which is motivating for great examples. <laughs> but they, they happen to land on a single lane road, and they also both happen to have a car immediately and then drive towards each other. Now, would you swerve to the left or to the right? So if, if it's common to drive on the right-hand side of the road, you would swerve to the right to avoid the other car, right? But the other car um, is also supposed to do that, or you would still smash into each other. But if the other car is thinking that it's actually in India, the other car would swerve to the uh, right. Left. Left. Ooh, there you go. OK, but if one car swerves to the right and the opposite to the left, they swerve in the same direction, right? So they still smash. Um, so if you have different road users, <laughs> um, well, it's not enough that you know yourself on which side of the road you have to drive, but the other road users have to know this as well. But you feel a lot safer if you know that the other road users well, also know this. So in a way, it's, it's a situation where you want it to be common knowledge on which side of the road to drive. OK, enough Martians. Uh, maybe not enough for today, but enough for this example. Um, so. Like for driving on the road, it, it says something like, well, common knowledge has to do with background knowledge. A bit like, like the setting of uh, what you have to know in order to, to then to behave and to act, right? Um, well, that's the same for car deals. So uh, what is common knowledge about uh, car deals in, in the setting of something like this? Well, it will be common knowledge that every player holds a single card. Or it will be common knowledge that everybody only knows their own card. Um, but here we have... a a method to check this uh, in detail, and um, we can say, well, it's common knowledge that N knows her card. Common knowledge I'm going to interpret. Later I'm going to uh, blast the slide with formulas at you. Common knowledge I'm going to interpret as something that is true in all states eh, that I can arrive at by a path of links with A, B, and C. Eh? So, well, it's a transitive closure operation. Um, why should it be true that it's common knowledge that N knows her own card? Well, that is true if it's true here, but also here, but also here, where I can get by an AB link, but also here, 
well, in fact, this will be true if it's true in every state of the model. Well, that means that we can interpret this by interpreting the, the formula bound by this operator in every state of the model. And then we have to check in every state of the model that either n knows that she holds card 0, or that she holds card 1, or that she holds card 2. Well, here she knows that she holds card 0 because it's true here and there. It's a no formula, so it has to be true in the equivalence class. Here she knows that she holds card 1, so that this junction is also true. Here she knows that she holds card 2, so that this junction is also true. Okay, we have verified the common knowledge uh, formula. If I talk 10 minutes about one slide, and given that I have about 70 slides, we will uh, need a lot of time. But I might speed up too occasionally. Uh, then I slow down again if you ask me questions, but please ask me questions, so there's nothing uh, against that. Yeah. Um, there are a number of different concepts for group knowledge, of which common knowledge is the most well known. Um, the, the, well, one of the lesser known concepts, but was, which was equally motivated for the development of the area, which was the one which I knew as uh, general knowledge, but which is also known as mutual knowledge. I've now made it mutual knowledge. Um, there are things that everybody knows, but you don't know it from other people. Um, let us simply go to the example. Um, if we look at this particular point, and we look at the statement that n holds 0, or Bill holds 1, or Kath holds 2, um, well, that is known by all players. It's known by n, well, because she knows that she holds card 0. Therefore, this junction is also known by her, right? It's known by Bill, because he holds 1. So this junction is also known by him. It's not by, well, etc. So all three players know that this formula is true. But they don't know that the other knows it. Yeah? So, in fact, this is merely something that holds, you might say, for um, all three relations. So, well, essentially it's something that holds in these four points of the model, but not if you go to the, well, you might say, to the transitive closure of uh, where you can get by one of these knowledge relations. Um, okay, here I cannot resist at least asking you a question. Uh, anyone knew this notion under the name of general knowledge? Or is this completely unfamiliar? Yeah. Uh, me, me too, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So up to like, uh, no, up to about yesterday, no, up to about two days ago, I, uh, I, I tended to, uh, to sell this notion as general knowledge. Um, then I had this, uh, this um, uh, well, I had to write this, this blurb for a book, and uh, I thought, okay, we might as well put, uh, and it's useful to do things for a common, general, and uh, distributed knowledge, and I sent this to uh, um, this guy, Joe Helper, and he said, what the hell is general knowledge? I've never heard of this. Ah, okay, so th apparently he didn't know this term, so maybe it's not so acceptable, uh, well, at least not generally used terminology, yeah. But as mutual knowledge seems to be, yeah. You, you, well, I keep learning, yeah. Sir. Sure. Mutual knowledge and common knowledge. Uh, I just couldn't get the major difference. Like, apart from mutual knowledge that I understand what the other is holding. Yeah. But uh, not to be sure that does the other really knows what I am holding. Is yes. Is this what you are calling as mutual knowledge? Um, it's not a two-way <laughs> process. If you have common knowledge, that, um, well, y y yes and no. It, I, I use it in in um, as a, in a one-way sense, but not in a two-way sense. So, if you have common knowledge, that implies mutual knowledge. But there are ways of mutual knowledge that are too weak to be called common knowledge. Yeah, so, if every well, if if you know something and I know something, and I don't know that you know it. Well, then we have mutual knowledge, but not common knowledge. Um, but if we have something common knowledge, it's still the case that we are allowed also to call this mutual knowledge, old, even though it's stronger than just both of us knowing it. 
So you, I think your question is whether you only use it in this exclusive sense. Yeah? Yeah. If we both know it, but uh, that it's ruled out, that I know it from you. Yeah, it's not used in that exclusive sense. Yeah. Okay. And, and the common uh, common knowledge that uh, the common knowledge of A B C being that A knows that N has zero, or A knows that uh, N has one, or whatever the it, it is a process till all the probabilities come through. Or is it just about a particular case? Um, what, what you do in... Um, yeah, there are a number of hidden assumptions here. So um, when I say this is considered possible and this is considered possible, I make... Um, um, you might say I, I make not any further modeling assumptions. Like I do not assign, uh, uh, for example, probabilities to, to what it's what really is the case, like, like this will be more likely or less likely. I just say, well, there's a set of things that I cannot distinguish between, and then th those are the things. Uh, so it's not, and it's, I'm not even saying this, this is 50% possible and this is 50% possible. And, and the operator K, uh, as here, I uh, just use by reference to this, in this case, this set of two things. Um, and there are lots of further refinements of these models wherein you might actually say more about um, well, a possibility in the sense of probability, but that would be a, a more um, detailed modeling. It, 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 that was your question, right? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, just to give an example, I, th I think I, I do this part slowly because all these lectures will be about, uh, well, all these today, tomorrow, about um, knowledge and belief. And, and I want you to, to get some intuition for what knowledge and belief is in this setting. Yeah. Um, by the way, a typical example of, of really uh, mutual knowledge um, in, in, in real life, you might say, is if, uh, if well, if, if three people meet and I don't know who this other person is, or, well, although I had been introduced like, uh, um, uh, well, uh, a week ago, and my friend doesn't know who this other person is, although um, he had also been introduced a week ago. So we have mutual knowledge that we don't know who this other person is. And, and that person actually suspects that as well. So it's even between the three of us, mutual knowledge. But if it were common knowledge, then it's very easy to ask, oh, I forgot your name, this and that. Um, but you consider it possible that the other person still knows, right? So you're not tempted to, to, to ask the question again or to, to introduce yourself once more. So there's a fine distinction between social settings uh, wherein things are mutual or only mutual knowledge and social settings wherein things are common knowledge. In fact, it's very hard to obtain this common knowledge, uh, 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 well, uh, setting. Yeah. Um, well, there's one other concept that we might see a bit further, which is distributed knowledge. So you might say distributed knowledge, uh, well, uh, in loosely speaking, is um, <coughs> what you can gain by communication. It's not exactly true, but um, in this, this car deal, um, if they were to tell each other what their card is, well, they will all learn what the car deal is. In, in setting of this structure is if you look at these equivalence classes and you take the intersection, so what's actually true in a point, then you go to a distributed knowledge. Um, okay, so we have common, mutual, and distributed knowledge, and there are things we will do with that, and the thing we will mostly see uh, more and more is uh, common knowledge, because uh, that, that plays a, a role in many of the axiomatizations I will present later. Good. Um, Okay, um, so having uh, spent a lot of time on this example, I now present the formal definitions and then we will proceed with uh, well, uh, doing the job and uh, making a logic of it. Uh, so it's common to have um, a number of parameters uh, that, that start out once you start uh, uh, well, defining these uh, systems, which is a set of propositional variables and a set of agents, uh, the, the players. Um, and we then define the, the structures <coughs> that we want to interpret these logical statements about knowledge and belief on. 
uh, like the hexagonal structure we have just seen, which always consists of a domain, and um, which, in the case of uh, what we are doing here, typically consists of um, associating a binary relation, for which we write R, to each agent. Uh, for which we in wish to model the knowledge. So we have a binary relation RA on this domain, uh, capital S. Um, and for also for each point uh, of this abstract structure, we want to say, well, whether a propositional variable is true or false uh, in that point. And we do this by uh, having a valuation function that associates to each such variable the subset of the domain consisting of the states where this uh, thing is true. Um, okay, and that's an epistemic model, and it's also common to consider these in, you might say, with a designated state, and then we call it a pointed epistemic model. Um, and I will allow myself a number of simplifications, so, um, well, I like to uh, write short and not long, so I use this uh, A rather as a subscript than in the functional way. Uh, this is also a common way to use it, because then you give it as a set instead of a function. And because we consider, well, relations that tend to be equivalence relations, then I use this symbol, which is then used uh, more for equivalence relations than for other relations. Um, the language that we also have already seen then consists of the, uh, well, in BNF form, of the propositional fragment, uh, defined here by using negation and conjunction, plus uh, modal aspects, and we have therefore the individual knowledge operator Ka, and the <coughs> common knowledge operator uh, uh, capital C with a subscript, the group of agents who commonly know something. And for the dual operator, I write a hat. Um, so, being a subset of it? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, P is an element of the capital P, A is an element of the capital A, and B is a subset of uh, capital A. Yeah. Um, another common presentation is only to have this common knowledge for the entire group of agents, capital A, but um, we have examples where it's also used for subset. Yeah. Uh, perhaps A is always going to be a variance. Um, that's common, but it's actually not so essential. What about B? B better be a What about this B? No. Yeah. Ah, um, yeah. The, 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 both, well, it, it's common that this is countably uh, infinite and this is finite, but there are very few occasions where actually you need that this is finite, so you can almost do anything with two infinite sets. Um, in awareness logics, it becomes problematic. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So for these structures, the epistemic models, I write a capital M, and this designated state, the point, the underlying thing in the picture is then the S. Then, um, well, you, you will probably have seen the satisfaction symbol, but I write this as, uh, well, P is true in state S of structure M, or M comma S satisfies P. So then I give the semantics as a way to relate these structures to the formulas. This is the propositional part. Um, which you might say is standard. Um, the uh, part that we call the, the modal part for the epistemic operator says that um, agent A knows phi eh, in state S if and only if for all accessible states eh, according to the relation Ra we have that the formula is true in that accessible state T. Eh, so you have this structure, you step in the structure, and for all steps that you can do from a particular point, uh, the formula bound by this Ka operator should be true. Then for the common knowledge operator, you do exactly the same, but the steps you can do are taken, well, there are a number of ways to relate this, to define this, but the steps uh, are the steps in a derived accessibility relation, and this accessibility relation, this derived one, is the transitive closure of the union. So essentially it's saying anywhere I can go eh, by a finite path of um, well, uh, steps labeled with the agents in this uh, common knowledge group, the bound formula should be true. Eh? So 
uh, fine is common knowledge to group B if for all well, reachable T by finite path okay, B labeled phi is true. What is this plus? Plus? Uh, plus is transitive closure. Oh, plus. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So this derived accessibility relation is we take the union of the accessibility relation of all the agents and we take the transitive closure of that. Yeah. Um, here we have the example. I just do uh, one example uh, in detail. Um, so we're going to compute that A considers possible, that B considers possible, that C knows that A doesn't have uh, zero, which is, well, uh, conceivable. <laughs> um, and we can, well, uh, you might say, uh, so it's, it's now it's just a matter of rolling up this, this, uh, this computation because it's uh, compositional semantics. Um, we can justify this by making an A-step um, to the world 0 to 1, and then we only have to verify the expression bound by this operator, which is this remaining expression. Um, then we can do a B-step to 1 to 0, and we are left with uh, verifying that C knows that A doesn't hold uh, 0. Um, that we can justify by, well, uh, verifying that in both worlds that C considers possible, which is this one and this one, where we should both have that uh, A doesn't have uh, zero. And this is defined by exclusion from the membership relation in the sets representing where A holds zero, which was, uh, uh, of course, this set. And we are done. Okay. Um, maybe that was too quick. So in your picture, you also have these self loops, which are geographic you Um Yes, thank you. <laughs> um, maybe I should write a self loop on the board. Well, that's, uh, yeah. I write this, A. And I write this as an equivalence class because I treat this relation as an equivalence relation. Um, <coughs> but the equivalence relation is a relation that satisfies a number of properties which allow for a simplified visualization. So what do I really mean when I write this? Well, that we have that this pair is in the relation, that this pair is in the relation, that this pair is in the relation, and that this pair is in the relation. Yeah, so instead of having um, just one thing uh, linking these two states, we could think of the entire part of the relation that has to do with the two states as consisting of one, two, three, four, uh, uh, well, pairs in the uh, epistemic uh, accessibility relation. Yeah. And, well, same for all the other agents, yeah. Um, yeah, so from here, and I'm going to use, you might say, going to take for granted uh, lots of this computation stuff and uh, present results and this and that. So any further questions on, on this stage, like uh, this sort of computation would be Clear. Yeah, so, I was wondering why did you need the transitive closure? What, what was the? Well, because otherwise the two Martians might crash. So, the thing is that okay. if yeah yeah so if it's it's not enough that I know that I have to drive on the right side of the road, uh, and that the car coming towards me knows that, but I will feel safer if I know that. The other guy knows this too. That's how the transitive thing uh, starts to uh, work. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Um, one of the things one generally does is when you have 
than such structures and a logical language. Um, then, um, well, I'm not going to present this, uh, you might say, the way I like this. There's also ways in which you can relate uh, things in this language without referring to these structures at all. <laughs> Like if you have p and p implies q, you can get q, right? This is called modus ponens. Surely you have seen this in uh, propositional logic. Um, <coughs> and you can do a similar trick for, um, for uh, in modal logic. Like if, if, well, we're now talking about derivations, right? So if I have uh, derived some formula phi, um, well, then, then I actually can also make this into... Uh, uh, um, into a derivation of uh, I know that phi, and I call this like doing one step more. Well, let me bit, this is not very specific. So P or not P, surely that's true, right? That was a tautology. But if P or not P is tautology, then you want I know that P or not P to be also, um, well, something that, that holds, right? Something that works. So, um, and, and this, there are systems that allow you to derive I know that P or not P from P or not P as a single step, eh? extending, you might say, a derivation of P or not P into a derivation of I know that P or not P, and this step is then called necessitation, and this uses, well, what is called the derivation rule that says that if we already have, um, well, a derivation of phi, like a tautology, eh? then by extending this with one step, we can have a derivation of I know that uh, phi. And the one here is the one that I just called modus Um <coughs> There are um, more of these principles and uh, derivation rules, and the principles can be called axioms, right? And in that way, we get an axiomatic uh, system, um, also known as a Hilbert-style uh, axiomatization. And you then want to uh, know that uh, anything that, well, that you can do with relation to the structures that is, uh, that is valid, that it's also derivable. Um, after that, you realize that these, these Hilbert-style uh, derivations are very uh, complex, and then you forget about this, and then you want to do other things uh, related to, uh, well, manipulating uh, formulas that are maybe more related to, um, uh, well, uh, succinct or uh, 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 short procedures to manipulate formulas, and, and this tends to be long. But it's good to uh, mention the, the, the axiomatization also because part of these principles relate to what you well believe to be true uh, about uh, knowledge. <coughs> um, because after all, these axioms are uh, well, they are also um, uh, validities in this logic. So the main things one then wants to point out is the principles for. Um, the operations that, that are specific to the properties of knowledge. And one of these is that uh, if you know something, then it's actually the case. Right? So this is it's, it's called the principle of, of uh, that <coughs> knowledge is truthful. Or that you can reflect on what you know, that if you know something, that you know that you know it. Right? And there's also this more contested principle that if you're ignorant of something, then you know about your ignorance. Yeah, you can, just as you can reason about the ignorance of other agents, you might want to reason about your own ignorance. Um, and, um, <coughs> well, and similar principles to the principles for individual knowledge, we then also can consider for, uh, for common knowledge. And, um, well, it, you might say, I've, I forgot to mention the, the main principle uh, that, that, that it causes some trouble uh, under these circumstances. So this is principle, well, it's written with a K, but it's also called the principle K. Um, essentially, this principle says that what you do in your head reflects what's going on in the real world. <laughs> um, so if in my head I have phi implies psi, and if in my head I have phi, then in my head I can also get this conclusion psi. Um, this looks a bit like a modus ponens, right? So you might say, this is going, what's going on in the real world, but this is the, the way I can also use this in my head, but it's a dangerous thing, so it says that you know all the deductive consequences of, you might say, the little bits of knowledge that are uh, somewhere <coughs> dumped uh, in, in, the, in the corners of your mind. And that's a very strong assumption. 
But in, in logic, we always make this assumption. Yeah? So we assume that, that your knowledge is deductively closed, and as I said, also that you can reflect on your knowledge and on your ignorance. Um, <coughs> for common knowledge, these um, principles um, well, are partly the, the same. Yeah? So also for uh, well, something like uh, what's commonly known in a group uh, satisfies this principle that of this deductive closure that if you have phi implies psi and phi then you have psi um, but it also satisfies things that relate this common knowledge to the mutual knowledge I just introduced for example that if you commonly know something um, then well at least it's mutually known uh, so if it's true along a, a finite chain then it's true along the first step of the cha chain and also it's mutually known that you commonly know it so if it's true along a finite chain then it's not only true along the first step of the chain but if you do this first step then you can again uh, take any finite change from that point on um, okay did you show some semantics of the e operation in your uh, earlier slides semantics for e no, I did not. <clears throat> um, so we can define E, B, phi, as the conjunction of agents in B of K, A, phi. So, yeah, so, so it's mutual knowledge if it's known to all agents in the group B. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, that would be uh, indeed. Uh, yeah, here it matters that the set of agents is finite. Yes, yes. Yeah. Was that your... Uh, okay. Thank you. I think formally it can be extended. Yeah, I mean. <laughs> yeah, so I realized that, so the reason I said it doesn't matter is that um, mutual knowledge is not typically taken as a primitive in logical languages. So what you take as a primitive is, uh, well, um, the K and the C, and, and, and the E is defined by abbreviation. But yeah, indeed, if, if it were infinite, then you would already run into trouble here uh, as well. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, okay. This shows that I'm not a proof theorist. Yeah. Um, and belief. Um, some things I will uh, demonstrate relate to belief instead of to knowledge. So I thought this would be a good moment to, uh, to ask ourselves what the difference is between knowledge and belief. Yeah. So, uh, no, I'm a philosophy student basically. So I just wanted to understand something over here while you say that you, you can be ignorant of the self uh, and you can know it as well. So, I think this is where belief comes in. You, you are being ignorant of something and yet you want to believe in something. Yes. And... Uh, I, I would say that that would also... Uh, I would also want to have this principle for belief in me. That you can... But, but continue, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, to, uh, to have a belief and to have a knowledge, knowledge knowledge being like epistemologically we have a lot of ways to deduce knowledge and uh, one of which we are doing right now, the formal deductive manner. Uh, but, uh, like can we really specify that uh, an individual knowledge or a community knowledge is possible in in this very manner, the, we are being specific and uh, kind of uh, ignoring all the uh, say variables, the variables which, which are actually auxiliary in behavior, which are not so subtle. Yes, yeah, so there's a number of simplifying assumptions in this framework, well, a, a lot, <laughs> and, and you're uncovering some of these. So, um, at the beginning I said, let, uh, let us suppose a number of propositional variables, capital P. So the idea is that at the outset, before you are uh, starting to uh, model the knowledge or belief of uh, the, 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 oh, the, the agents, 
uh, you assume that the, the, the things that are relevant to know uh, are all, well, public, are all uh, there. So it's not like you're going to add later more uh, propositional variables that were not yet there. Uh, no, no, you start with everything, so to speak. And, and, and it's even common in, in, in applications. Well, not common in applications. Obviously, in applications, you have a finite set of propositional variables. Um, well, given that assumption, it's a lot more reasonable to have a principle like this. Because given that assumption, um, for every variable, uh, you can determine whether you know it or not uh, in, in a given model. Because that's just a computation you can make in a system. Well, but if for every variable you can make that computation, then you can make that computation also in every, well, you might say state that you consider possible, that is consistent with your current uh, knowledge, and, and determine if you know or do not know that variable in all the states that you consider possible. Well, that's almost like a proof that this is a valid principle. Yeah. Given all the objects, given all the objects we, uh, and their interactions, we can come up with a possible state of affairs. All the possible state of affairs of their occurrence and non-occurrence. But yes. But as as soon as you come up with this project of having a real entity and an unreal entity, the problem lies here. The the variables which which are actually being presupposed and we can actually formulate their functioning in the real existence but to come up with the <coughs> unreal entity into a real existence and enacting onto our uh, possible state of affairs how, how is logic going to solve this like this particular paradigm ah this i don't know i'm only talking about real entities here yeah Un unreal entities it, it, it this areas of logics that investigate that but um, and free logic, uh, but yeah, yeah, I do. Uh, you, you, you might say the, the, the set of propositional variables that I uh, assume yeah, at the outset of modeling this are the, the supposed properties of the real entities that we stipulate for our modeling. Yeah, no, uh, no unreal entities here. So even not the uh, unreal entities, there are the possibilities like the multi. Uh, sorry. Uh, the the mutual knowledge the mutual knowledge of me knowing that uh, what you have yeah. but not to be sure of that do you really know what I have okay yeah yeah Th that accounts for the uh, mutual knowledge sure and if we are applying this kind of knowledge into a particular paradigm the the resultant is supposed to be like uh, it it can it cannot come up with a real answer. Well, that depends on what answer you require. So, um, typically here, if, if we're thinking of science of structure, we want to do model checking. We want to know if a particular formula in this logical language is true or false in a given structure. Um, but, but this formula that you want to, uh, of which you want to determine the truth, can itself be about knowledge or ignorance. So, so sometimes it's, well, sometimes the real answer is in, in terms of that you want things not to be known. And, well, if, if we look later like, like security protocols, uh, you definitely don't want the eavesdropper to have the real answer to uh, the secrets you, you're trying to guard. So, um, um, well, I can't relate it to, um, um, yeah. I would like to address that, that um, uh, well, so maybe it's a restrictive framework yeah, where you suppose a number of relevant things you want to have knowledge or ignorance about, and even suppose a number of agents, but then you stay within this restricted framework and you don't go outside of it. There's a lot outside, but we simply don't talk about what is outside. Yeah. Yeah. I can just yeah. add to that. I mean, basically, Philosophically, knowledge is a very complex thing and there are many theories about it. But <coughs> this is a kind of simplified version which is, say, useful for, let's say, artificial intelligence or, uh, or yes. something like that. Yes. That, that's the view you are adopting. Uh, 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 and maybe Olivier will talk more about other notions of knowledge too. Uh, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, no, probably not. But 
I just wanted to, to ah, point yeah. out that, that even in that framework, there are philosophically interesting issues that are raised. I mean, you talked about the K axiom, which is the notion of whether knowledge is closed under known implication. It's a very debated question in epistemology under various views about what knowledge is. Yeah. Right? So, this is something which is already very philosophically very interesting. Yes. I always think of this uh, closed uh, under deduction. It's a worst case scenario, right? Um, so you talk to someone who knows everything you say, the deductive consequences of uh, what you're uh, telling. So, in, but, in, well, at least if in, in modeling uh, protocols like security protocols, then the worst case scenario is what you want to be up against. Yeah? So it's an idealization of, of, of knowledge and of belief. Um, and within that idealization, you'd better be up against uh, anything that might follow from what the other person uh, knows. Yeah. But uh, if you want to have a more realistic scenario, then uh, weaker than everything is good enough. Well, but then you have to define what good enough is and what weaker is. So there are lots of problems there. Yeah, so that, that's a whole branch of uh, science called epistemology. And, and the, the sort of modeling I hear uh, present just as the truth, but <laughs> Well, is the truth relative to, uh, uh, you might say, well, in particular to, to artificial intelligence and, and applications, um, but in particular to, to um, well, modeling settings where you can talk about agents but also about processes or processors. Yeah, so, so a typical setting is that when you have communicating processes where processes have some sort of uh, local state, and that is then what they know. Well, and under those assumptions, you want them to behave um, according to these principles. That's the idea. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, does it make uh, any sense if instead of taking conjunction here in, in, TV, in this definition, uh, we uh, introduced any other operator with this disjunction? That would mean that somebody of this group totally knows this, something like that. Somebody belonging to this group, not that everybody. You can do that. And no, does it make sense in, uh, from, from practical angle or uh, application standpoint? Or you know, that's that is my question. Because this operator is quite very interesting. I mean, yeah. Well, if you put it this junction, it's beginning to look like distributed knowledge, but not exactly like this, because. Uh, uh, then it's not even necessary for uh, an individual to know it. So the disjunction as such is not commonly used. No, that's true. Yeah, but, yeah. yeah. That's why yeah. I was asking whether... Yeah. But, but it is a different... It would make a different operator. Yeah, yeah, you could yeah. stipulate this yeah, as no, a primitive so operator. Follow from... Yeah. Uh, formally, it doesn't follow. You cannot define that. Uh, no, no, formally it doesn't follow. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. I still didn't get to the belief part, right? Um, what, what's the, the, well, the typical difference between knowledge and belief, at least even within the restricted uh, systems I'm uh, studying here, is that knowledge is supposed to be true. Um, that's why you're talking about knowing. And, um, um, <laughs> and, and, and belief may be uh, wrong. Yeah? So um, the principle for knowledge was that k phi implies phi. Um, <laughs> yeah, maybe the, the lights do not have to flip all the time, uh, I think. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> um, but belief may be incorrect. So is there a way you can um, also uh, express this in this system? Well, one thing you want to, well, one thing is, which is nice about this is this sort of reasoning up to the deductive closure. Uh, so if you have two things, then in your mind, you can draw a conclusion from that. So even if your knowledge is incorrect, you want to keep such a principle. So even for belief, you want to keep a principle like this. But well, on, on similar arguments, and I could make these arguments a lot longer, you want to also to keep principles like this. But you definitely don't want to use this. Now you can, uh, you, can you might say, a trick by uh, saying that, well, um, if I believe something, then at least it should be um, 
consider it possible that you believe it. Um, so, if we replace this principle by that, then we can go a long way and model something for a very related notion that we call belief instead of knowledge. Okay, but let me uh, continue here with uh, other methods. Yeah. Um, okay. Um, yeah. Yes. So it says that um, if you have. Um, yes. Let me write this down. Uh, it, it's not necessary to switch the lights. It's. Uh, I think I'll be fine. Yeah. <clears throat> Another way to write this down is like this. Okay, so the head is defined as not k not, and in terms of the structure, the k phi is what is, and phi is true in all accessible states, anywhere where you can go by an arrow, okay, and the not k not phi is true if there is one arrow wherein you can reach phi. Yeah. Okay. Um, here we go. Um, now I'm wondering about the wiseness of including these methods, but they are uh, rather interesting from a technical perspective that will come back later in the presentation. Um, so I've been talking about uh, common knowledge. And common knowledge was defined as what's true okay, along a finite path of <coughs> uh, links labeled with the agents occurring in the group uh, B. And that is a you, you might say a more modern notion called relativized common knowledge, which is saying the same thing, but you require a condition along all the nodes in that finite, uh, well, in these, uh, in these paths. Yeah? So instead of normal uh, common knowledge, we have relativized common knowledge. Um, in fact, I think it's, it's a nice idea by Jan van Bentham, essentially, or, or a nice idea, you might say, coming from temporal logics that is applied more to a, an epistemic setting. Um, so we do not have just along all the, the B paths, but along all the B paths satisfying condition Psi. Right? So the semantics of um, its common knowledge to group B right? relative to Psi that Phi is that along all the B paths satisfying the condition Psi, it holds that Phi. Um, <coughs> similar to having the transitive closure of the union yeah, of the relations for the agents in uh, B. Well, an elegant way to define this is to have this as a transitive closure of the union, well, of the, the, the Psi A relations for the agents A and B, yeah, where this relation holds if between two states S and T, if S and T are, are in that relation, and if the condition Psi holds in the, at the end of the arrow yeah, in T. So we have the union of the relations for the agents in the group B. But now we do not take, well, just these relations, but we take the relations such that the second argument in a pair in the relation satisfies the condition psi, yeah, the relativization. And if you then take the transitive closure of that, well, you're walking along paths labeled with agents of that relation that satisfy that condition along every point in the path. Now, and then you can uh, ask yourself the question, yes, but why don't do this a lot simpler? <laughs> um, if it's a condition, just make it into a condition. Um, so, you might say the question is, eh, why is this expression relativized common knowledge for, well, condition phi? Why is it not just equivalent to common knowledge of phi implies psi? Well, let us just look at a, an example here. So, here we have simple uh, model, three states. I hope you can still uh, see this. Um, so um, here P and Q are true, here P is false and Q is true, and here P is true and Q is false. Okay. So if we look at the world W in this three state structure, then in the point W, yeah, we have that it's, well, uh, relativized common knowledge for A and B, that Q relative to condition P. Because anywhere we can go along a path that satisfies condition P, Q 
Q is true. Where can we get from this uh, structure? Well, in particular, we can get to where we are. And the condition P is satisfied, so Q should be satisfied here. Uh, can we go here? No, no, because we don't have P here. So we get stuck. Yeah, so this relativized common knowledge is true in this point yeah, because, well, uh, this is staying there is the only path we can do. Now, if you look at whether it's common knowledge to A and B that P implies Q, that has to be true to anywhere where you can get, again, by an uh, A-B path, so staying where you are, or going here, or even going here, yeah, along the two path, and everywhere it should be true that P implies Q. Um, well, here we have P and not Q, false. Okay, so it's not only a condition. Okay. If the condition is true, we had what we already had, and uh, common knowledge for group B relative to condition true. So this, this T is a way of writing the true proposition or the P or not P proposition. Then we have common knowledge as we already had. Um, <clears throat> what I then write is that this knowledge is more a, well, this notion is, is, is expressive. I, I will not actually uh, be very formal in defining what, what expressive means, but it, it's, well, it, it, it means that you can say more about the, 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 the structures and the hexagonal things we have seen so far with this notion than without. Yeah? But in order to do that, you need more complex examples. Um, but I will use this notion of expressiveness to, uh, to compare a number of axiomatizations I will later show about these systems I uh, um, will discuss. Where will I should qualify given that it's now five minutes past ten, right? Yeah. I should at least do public announcement logic. I think we're coming very close to public announcement logic now. Um, lots of things about history. Um, well, one thing I could say. Um, will these slides be online on the Islamas webpage? Okay, if you want to know a bit about history, look it up. And let's go on with uh, explaining the structures and examples. Um, public announcements. Um, after Anne says that she doesn't have card one, Kath knows that Bill has card one. Do we want this? No? Um, so, well, it depends on where you are. <laughs> if the actual card deal is that N has zero, Bill has one, and Kath has two, then it's true that N can say that she doesn't have card one, right? Um, yes. But that's obvious. Everybody's truthful. No? Ah. Okay. In, in, in epistemology, there are lots of things you can say about not being truthful. So here, I'm, this is one of these simplifying assumptions. Um, we are assuming, well, first we are assuming that what Anne is saying, that Bill and Kath can hear that. And, and even that she can hear this herself. Now, now we're getting back to this, this I'm a C car uh, starting up. So if the exhaust pipe uh, starts to, uh, well, blow out uh, fumes, everybody is hearing that, and you know that the person standing next to you is hearing that as well. So public announcements are, uh, are um, well, publicly observed events. It's, it, it's actually a logic of uh, public observations, but it's too late to call it now like that. So it just has been called public announcements. Um, events cannot lie. Well, maybe they can. But the thing with announcements is that it's linguistic and then the, the thing of not truthful comes up naturally, right? So therefore, public announcements here means public truthful announcements. So if N says, where saying means saying truthfully and saying publicly, but yeah, that she doesn't have card one, well, that will be informative for Kath because she has card two. And then her uncertainty should remove between N or Bill having card one, and she concludes that Bill must have it. We can say this in this uh, setting by 
well, having another operator uh, of which I will define the semantics, um, uh, which actually says that there is a public announcement that n does not have card one. Um, slightly different from N saying that, but we will overlook that difference. After which, Kath knows that Bill has card one. Um, okay, after N says that she doesn't have card one, therefore, whatever the situation, uh, including that, Kath would now know N's card. Um, yeah, true. Bill still doesn't know that. Hmm? Um, okay. We add an operator to the language called the public announcement operator. We write a square bracket to say, okay, it's again uh, an, 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 well, a modal operator, something of, uh, that we uh, tend to see in forms uh, that are a box. No, there's no agent. Um, in your example, you might Yeah. Um, in the, you might say the original setting of public announcement logic, or maybe not the original setting. It's like God revealing the truth. Um, you're not supposed to name God, so there's no agent. So it's un, un, unindexed. Um, it's also a bit in the public aspect of uh, what the new information is. So the new information, you might say, uh, comes to a system from outside and has then to be incorporated into the system. But you don't model the, well, it's out, the, the proposition is outside the system you don't care about. The agents outside the system you don't care about. So, so therefore, and, and, and because it's public, therefore, uh, there is no uh, label to this. In the example I gave, it's N saying that, but um, yeah, you might say it's for didactic uh, purposes. Yeah. And then we uh, uh, bracket uh, over this plus one. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Yeah. Right. Well, it, it, if if you put, um, but it still has to be a formula. So what you're allowed to do is if you have a, some object of type formula and an object of type formula, then one of these you're allowed to put into brackets and put the other one behind it. Then you can put the entire thing in brackets again and then a formula. And then a formula. That's, that's what's well, right. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But without and then a formula, it's not a... Yeah, yeah. And again, I have a, a diamond form. Yeah. Thank you very much. So similar to the thing for knowledge, if we have not box form not psi, we write this as what, diamond form psi. Yeah. So this we read after the announcement of phi, psi is true. And this you can say, re well, independently from the, the truth of the public announcement. If I, if, if, if I were to make a public announcement that it's now a half past a 10, then uh, we, uh, well, we will all go bananas. Uh, sure, but it's not half past 10, so it, it, it's conditional on the truth of the public announcement. Yeah? So here, um, okay, um, I'm making the public announcement that it's a quarter past 10, that is actually correct, I think. Uh, and therefore, we still continue with this lecture for 15 more minutes. Um, it's a bit confusing because uh, the thing with these public announcements is that there's only, uh, well, either they're true and then you do something relative to it, relative to it or not, and you, then you don't. Yeah? But there are no different ways to handle this information. Yeah? So it's more a function than a relation. Um, now the main thing is, uh, what do you do to uh, process this new incoming information? Um, unlike the, the previous modalities, eh, where we interpreted a K-modality by giving a certain uh, system a structure and doing an internal step in this structure, um, I'm now changing the structure itself and I'm not doing an internal step. 
and the change is a model restriction. So I'm going to make a model restriction of that structure. Um, <coughs> so the effect of this public announcement is a restriction of the structure to all states that satisfy the formula of the public announcement. Um, well, and that's it. Well, what do you do? What, what is a restriction? Well, our principal structures were epistemic models that consisted of a domain, um, a binary relation eh, for each agent, this accessibility relation and evaluation. Well, if you do the restricted domain, you have to do something also with this relation and evaluation. Um, namely, you restrict them to the new domain. That's what's being said here. So, if I have in a structure the formula after public announcement of phi psi, and I want to interpret there, and then the thing I have to do is, okay, um, check that the formula is true, it has to be a truthful public announcement, and on condition of that, I compute the restriction of the structure to the, the states where it's true, and then I start to evalu evaluate the post condition where this restriction is defined as, um, well, another epistemic model with a new domain as prime, a new set of uh, accessibility relations, um, well, uh, squiggle prime and evaluation v prime, and the s prime is what I just said, consists of the sets of states that satisfy the formula of the announcement. And having this notation, then this and this is the obvious restriction, well, of making a new valuation and accessibility relation. And this works better by example. This is the example. So here we have uh, our motivating uh, example. The announcement is made in the actual state that n does not have card zero. In fact, she makes that announcement, pardon, that n does have card one. She makes that announcement herself. And then we want to check that c then knows that n has card zero. And is saying, I don't have card one. C concludes, ah, then she must have card zero. We, um, we now use the diamond form of this. For the diamond form, we have to check that this is true. And then we compute the model restriction and check the post condition in the model restriction. Um, <coughs> in this state, it's indeed the case that n doesn't hold card one. Yeah, so the condition is true. Um, then we compute the model restriction to the states where n doesn't hold card one. Um, well, those are all except those where she holds that card. So we rule out this and that. And the part uh, compute the restriction of accessibility relation is just, you might say, that you remove the, the lines going here because here doesn't exist anymore. So then you simply cut out these parts and that one. Then you get there. Then we are not yet done because in that restriction we finally have to satisfy the, 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 the required post condition that, um, what was it again? That Kath knows that N holds card zero. Um, here, Kath should know that N holds card zero. What Kath knows is what is true in all states that she cannot distinguish. Here there were two. Here there's only one. In this single state, well, it's indeed the case that n holds card zero, therefore Kath knows that. Okay, that's the semantics of public announcement. Um, questions? Um, the reason is, is merely a simplification of the exposition, but you could add distributed knowledge too. Yeah. Um, I, I'm presenting this logic with individual and with common knowledge, um, and you could also have it with distributed knowledge, but I haven't done this. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, not one reason, but one justification to do this is that if you add something like distributed knowledge, this will affect the, 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 the properties of the logic and uh, let me think, um, well, at least the axiomatization would then be more uh, complex, yeah, yeah. But you have a common knowledge with distributed knowledge and common knowledge? We have axiomatization with distributed knowledge. 
then with distributed and common knowledge, probably two, but that I do not actually know. I would think so, but it's funny. I know I know axiomatizations of public announcement logic with distributed knowledge, um, and I know axiomatizations of public announcement logic with common knowledge because that's the one I present here. Um, I, I forgot if the axiomatization with distributed knowledge also addresses the aspect of having both distributed and common knowledge. Yeah. Ah, okay, yeah, okay, so thank you, yeah. You would have to have distributed knowledge as a primitive, right? It's not definable in terms of knowledge operator like mutual knowledge. Uh, yes, right. that is the problem indeed, yeah. Yeah, because it yeah yeah it's it it comes close to the, the disjunction thing, but not exactly. So we need to have it as a primitive. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um. Well, more motivation. Um, this lecture contains a lot of motivation. I hope it comes across. Um. <coughs> So the, the main thing, if you see this thing for the first time, is you, you might say you ask yourself a number of obvious questions and you wonder what is the answer to those questions. So a public announcement is like saying something and after that something else is true, right? So that looks a bit like uh, implication almost, right? So why is phi after announcement of phi psi not the same as phi implies psi? Okay, well, phi and psi two uh, form that. Well, a, a, a typical... Uh, uh, example where this is not the case <coughs> is that public announcements make things known. So after public announcement of P, P is known because then the not P states have disappeared. Um, but P implies KP, that's definitely not uh, always true. There are lots of things that are true but not known. Yeah, so it's not, not an implication. <coughs> um, well, uh, having said that, it's, it's, it seems interesting to think of public announcements as, well, uh, things that get known, right? Because I was just saying that. So would it then be exactly like that? No, it's also not exactly like that. Um, because there are things that you can say, but that do not get known by being said. Um, that sounds weird. Um, well, at least I hope to, to have a motivating example there. The typical example is that you can say that P is true. Well, you can be told that P is true and that you don't know this. It's a way of being informed that P is true in a state wherein you were so far ignorant of the truth of P. But after that, you know then that P. Um, well, maybe we should see this by example, right? That's better. So this, this will be my, my example. I'm coming close to the break. So um, this is my example. Um, OK, you do not know that I will play cello on Friday. So, so, so this is something of that form. Well, let us assume for a moment that I'm being truthful. What do you learn from this information? Well, you, you learn about your own ignorance, but I've just been explaining to you that you can know things about your own ignorance, right? So if this were a proposition that you would find relevant, then um, you could think, yeah, yeah, I don't know if this guy is going to uh, do this or not on Friday. I have no idea. But now I'm informing you that I will do this. But in a way, I'm telling you this while informing you of that ignorance. So it's being informed of the truth of the formula P and not KP. And now... Uh, well, well, okay. So I'm going to impress the truth of this matter on all of you. So I'm saying you again. You don't know that I will play cello on Friday. Can I do this? Well, yes, I just did. But would that still be a truthful announcement? Well, no. Why is that? Um, well, you, 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 should, you can sort of make the puzzle now, right? If I inform you that 
of these facts while you're in a state of ignorance, then having been informed about that, you know it. Then you're no longer in a state of ignorance. So even man telling you that you are in a state of ignorance, that's false. That can't be true. So this is sort of information I cannot feed you twice truthfully. The second time must be a lie. Yeah, well, whether a lie is something that I know to be false. Um, objections? Good. Ah, yes. Oh. Uh, yeah, so there's a number of implicatures there. So um, okay. you might say the. the, the no, yeah. As it's stated, it doesn't uh, give. So we have this. Yeah. So th there's a proposition P. I will play cello on Friday. And the announcement is P and not KP. Where K is your knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, and, and but uh, you, you might say that this is typical shortcut in actual conversation that you allow yourself to be more uh, economic. Uh, well, not economic with the truth, but economic with conveying information. So the idea is that um, if you say this, actually you say P and not KP. Okay. Um, which was written here anyway. Um, so we have that this is P and not KP. And, and I think, oops, no, too, too fast. Um, what you have is that after being informed of P, actually you know P, but... Uh, Knowing P is weaker than, uh, well, KP or not P. And not P or KP is the negation of P and not KP. So in fact, we have that after this announcement of P and not KP, the negation of P and not KP is true. And this is saying that you cannot announce this truthfully twice. The second time must be a lie. That would not be truthful. Um, and... Um, you might say this is, well, this is an interesting, in a way, this is the motivating uh, example for the existence of public announcement logic. Therefore, it exists. And therefore, people find this interesting because it's, it's, it's puzzling. <laughs> um, <coughs> there is the <coughs> expectation <coughs> that if something is true, then if you tell this to someone, then that person knows it. Hmm? And, an, and another way of writing that is writing this. Hmm? So, so the diamond hmm, semantics was that phi is true. But if on condition of phi, then it's the same to the box. <clears throat> and for some things this is the case, like for propositional variables, but it's not always the case. So this pattern resembles this pattern, and this pattern is not a validity of this logic. <clears throat> and the counterexample we were showing was this counterexample. Um, in, in fact, uh, we showed that this is false, but if something is false, it's definitely not known. <clears throat> and, and the way that you can compute simply that, uh, uh, well, this cannot be a validity, is that if I make the announcement P and not KP, and if I'm starting with a model with initial uncertainty about the value of P, then the recipe of this public announcement logic said restrict the model to the states where P and not KP is true. And we have two states, one where P is true and one where P is false. And the state where P is true, um, it's also the case that P is not known. Okay? So therefore the formula P and not KP is true. Uh, just a minute. In the state where P is false, well, it's definitely not the case that the, this, the, the conjunction P and not KP is true. And so the restriction is only to the state where P is true. Sorry, your question? So, uh, is it true that every purely propositional formula that, that I can uh, that is implied by phi uh, for them, I would know K of that after it's announced? If it's propositional, yes. Yeah. 
Yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I see another, another problem. Uh, suppose you take uh, box P, right? And then put Q here. Is it the well for formula? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you can announce that. Yeah. Uh, now, without a knowledge operator, I mean, uh, in the following formula, uh, does it make sense? So, announce something and, and then uh, place something which is, uh, which doesn't contain knowledge operator. Or does it start even with knowledge? Well, it makes sense to me because I can announce that I will make uh, play cello on Friday and then I can check whether after this announcement coffee will be served downstairs in the pantry. That's <laughs> P and Q completely unrelated propositions and there might still be an interest in knowing whether this is true or false. Yeah. So, so it's, it's just a question of model checking. You can put anything in the announcement, you can put anything else uh, that you check after the announcement. But some kind of relevance come with No. No. Nothing. Um, well, you you could, but here there's no condition of relevance whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. My intuition says that without, uh, I mean, this becomes in a sense uh, doesn't make much sense. Yeah, the announcement will affect the state of the world. Maybe Hans announces that he plays cello, and the people supplying coffee will take it. So then, then after the announcing that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So there, there, there are different settings. Wherein, even though you have different variables p and q, the announcement of p addresses the truth of, of q, or or something related. No. Not not the truth of q. That will be never be the case. Yeah. But it, it's. it's yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Understandable. Yeah. But p here and just simply q here. Uh, uh, then it's independent. Me, it yeah. Make much. Uh, it seems to me that some kind, without some kind of relevance between P and Q, uh, making such a thing is a formula. Formally it is okay. And even you give a formal semantics. But uh, mm. there is the equivalence yeah. of boss PQ if and only if Q. It's an equivalence of boss PQ if and only No, no, it's it's this actually, not P and Q. It's P. It's conditional. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So this is a validity. Oh, Ah, you want to say? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That that helps. So in a sense, it 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 it, it is obvious. <laughs> in a sense, it is. Oh, and, and now I understand. So. And it, so in that sense, it is relevant because we have an implication here. Is that yeah, an answer? That, that is why P and Q, you do the job, P implies Q, you do the same job as this. Yes. Right? So, so, so you don't need that. I mean, you don't need this at all. Well, for this P, for, for variables. Right. Only for variables. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's good because this is, is, is this is like a run up to uh, to the final uh, question here, um, and and I had two because there was another run up. Uh, um, so this unsuccessful updates thing is you what? Know, it's not a big business, but it's one of these things that interested uh, people in the area, and and then the question became for what sort of formulas like variables here. Huh? Um, th well, this shape is actually a validity when it's always true. Huh? And, and indeed, if, if it's just propositional formulas, then it's not just for uh, variables, but for any Boolean you can do this. Um, and, uh, and this question has not been answered in general. Let me just say uh, that uh, about it. Yeah. And, and the other thing is that if we look at an equivalent such as this, I'm aware of the time, by the way, but I want to have a few minutes more. Um, then here the question again comes up what the, well, having now this uh, logic, uh, what a complete axiomatization would be for this system. Yeah? And 
um, then we want to consider principles like this, and this I think we will now skip for a moment. And look, we have seen this here. <laughs> well, where phi would be p uh, like there. So we can wonder about what the principles are uh, that relate this public announcement operation to the other variables, or not the other variables, to the other logical operators uh, in, this, uh, in this logical language. And, and we have just seen the intuition behind one of them. Uh, but there are many others. This I will not now rush off in the minute uh, towards uh, the break. Uh, I will just pick up there uh, tomorrow. So tomorrow I will continue by discussing a bit more about the, the, the things you can do given that you have this public announcement uh, logic. Um, and, then we'll, uh, and then I will present a generalization uh, of this logic to, well, um, to non-public announcements. Well, I didn't like the word announcement, right? It was a, like a logic of public events, so you might say to non-public events. Then, then you come to things like whispering, showing cards, private announcements. Um, so in, in a way, the, you, well, you, you want to make things, uh, well, I don't want to make things more complex, but things get more complex. <laughs> Um, but they don't really get more complex. It's the same intuition as behind public announcement logic, but you have to do things at uh, individual agent level. Yeah. Um, and I think then that is a good moment to stop uh, for today. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.